You're listening to a podcast of Master Your Finances with me, Kurt Baker, a certified financial planner professional. Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. on 1077thebronc.com. Good morning and welcome back to another edition of Master Your Finances, presented by Certified Wealth Management and Investment. I am Kurt Baker, a certified financial planner professional located in Princeton, New Jersey. I can be reached through our website, which is www dot cwmi dot us or you can call me directly at 609-716-4700 and this week uh very pleased to have with us adrian dove uh who was born and raised in philadelphia pennsylvania graduated from drexel university in 1985 with a bs in accounting and immediately began her career in pharmaceutical finance and accounting, received her MBA from Rutgers in 1995, and spent 33 years across three pharma companies, J&J, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Novartis. About 12 years ago, she began a journey into having a complete financial freedom and control over her personal finances. She learned how to live off of a monthly budget, which led to a level of discipline that resulted in debt elimination. The end result of that after being laid off was she was able to transition into a second career that she loves and hopes to be able to pursue for the next 15 years and help others to do the same. You're living the American dream here. So you went from Philly, you went across the river, so to speak, and to visit us in Pharma Land, which is New Jersey. If people aren't aware of that, we're kind of like this pharma center of the world. So. What kind of triggered your like passion for pharma to start with? That's a very interesting, I mean, you're in Philly, so you're not really in pharma land there, right? So did you kind of look across the river and say, hey, what's over there? So I'll tell you, in my senior year at Drexel, uh, there was a lot of recruiting that was done on campus. And uh, I was an accounting major, so I had a choice between auditing and public accounting or doing private industry. And the pharma companies actually, it was J&J, came on campus. I interviewed. And I, I, I liked um, just the industry, the ability to, to, like, to learn something different because I had already done auditing as an intern. So if people don't know much about Drexel, when I was at Drexel, they had a co-op program where you would go to school for six months and work for six months. And I had enough experience with auditing to know that I didn't want to do that. Okay. So, this I'm with was, you on that one. <laughs> this was my next opportunity. So I was willing to come to New Jersey and learn something different. And it lasted for 33 years across three different companies. 33 years. Yeah. That's 30. just like impossible. I'm looking at you right now, <laughs> and there's no way you could have had a career. So those you can't see her, she looks very young for her age, I have to say. So she must have started like, I don't know, five, six, seven years no. old. You got out of Drexel when no. it went something like that. <laughs> so... <laughs> But anyway, yes, that's fantastic. So 33 years in pharma, that's a long time in pharmacy. You must have learned a lot about that industry because uh, it's kind of a unique industry, I'm assuming, right? It, it is. And, uh, and, and I will say in my journey in pharma, because I had an accounting degree, pharmaceutical accounting and finance is very specialized. So there's a lot of things that you would do in a pharmaceutical company that you wouldn't do in another industry, right? So right. the general accounting turned into financial planning and analysis. So I managed like a profit and loss statement for a franchise, for a brand. And then that turned into managing financial analysis and contracts for what we call managed care. So for health plans and pharmacy benefit managers. And that probably doesn't exist anywhere outside of pharma. Okay. Like the pharma companies compete with each other to make sure that they get their drug in a certain class, um, they want to get their drug with uh, preferred formulary access. So when we say preferred, it's tiered to preferred unrestricted access. Okay. And I mean, that's the goal. That's the goal. If you have five or six products in the same class and you have five or six uh, pharmaceutical companies all competing, they're trying to get that preferred access with the drug, the, the, the plans that manage the drugs. Right? So... Or manage the insurance for the drugs. So uh, they want to get reimbursed. Yeah. Right? So when you go okay. into CVS or Walgreens and you need to fill a prescription and you you have a drug, say for diabetes or hypertension, if 
the pharmaceutical company was successful in getting that preferred access, you go in, you pay a small copay, you get your drug. If you're not successful, that means that your drug could probably be on a third tier, which means that the patient or you would have to pay more money for it, or it could just be blocked and you'd have to pay cash for it. So there's this competition that goes on between the pharma companies to try to get that unrestricted access because that translates into higher market share, which is which means more sales. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. I, I mean, I'm not an expert in the pharma field mm -hmm. at all, and I don't even really like have a lot of prescription drugs. I don't have any, so no, that's, that's a very good. low number. Yeah. But I, 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 but I have had to go there and pick out drugs, you know, for family members, and I know that. Some of them, you walk in, and it's like 10 bucks. Some they walk in, they say, yeah, that'll be $1,500 for the next two weeks. And you're like, and they just kind of look at you like, that's not a problem. And you're looking at them like, um, yeah, that's a little bit of an mm -hmm. issue here. That's a lot of money for most people. So it, it, I find it, the, the, the band is just huge it's, when it's it comes huge. to like prescription and drugs. The whole uh, formulary placement and managing formularies that goes on at the, the plans that they're, they're called pharmacy benefit managers. It's a long process. They have what they call p and It's a pharmacy and therapeutics committee that meets several times a year, and they evaluate the drugs for efficacy and also for economics. So you could have five drugs. In terms of efficacy, they all react the same way, and they'll you know, react the same way in the patient. So um, in that case, they would look at the economics. How is the drug priced? And are you going to give me a rebate? Like, are you going to give me, um, like, a discount on the price of that drug in terms of a rebate? And that process is a huge financial process in pharmaceutical companies. So this companies. is the insurance company talking to the pharma this, companies? Or yeah, so, so or there's, employers and things like there's that? actually uh, a huge account team in pharma companies that call on the pharmacy benefit managers, and mm -hmm. that's what they do. They, they want to make sure that we get the best access, uh, formulary access possible, which would be tier two unrestricted formulary access. And then there's all different types of restrictions. There's step edit, a double step edit. There's prior authorization. So oh these word. are all these are all things <laughs> that they exist in pharma. They exist in pharmaceuticals and the financial analysis around that is something that I did for almost half of my career. So in addition to doing uh, the financial analysis because you want to make sure that the rebase that you're giving the pharmaceutical company is going to result in what the pharma company, I mean the rebase that you're giving the health plans mm -hmm. and the pharmacy benefit managers is going to result in the pharmaceutical companies having higher market share. Like those rebates um, are supposed to, again, give you that preferred access, which means that some other uh, drugs in the class are not going to have preferred access. So you should end up having higher market share, which results in higher sales. So there's a whole financial analysis associated with that. I guess so, because you don't want to lower your price too much. Because sometimes no. there's always that conversation so, in sales, right? A high price, less volume, more profit. Low price, more volume. I mean, which one ends up with more profit, right? Because you have to look at the margin as well as the volume altogether, because then you see this big bucket of money. And how does it get bigger or smaller when you do that, right? True. So technically, the price would stay the same, mm -hmm. but the rebate that you would give to the pharmacy benefit manager would end up being a lower price for them. Okay. So the pharma right. company, I, you have, you got me interested. The pharma company just say, oh, uh, this is a nice little pill I'm looking at. Uh, that's <laughs> That looks like a $1,200 pill to me. I mean, because it seems sometimes to us on the consumer side, mm -hmm. it's like this fuzzy math. It's like, I have no clue how you came up with this number. And then all of a sudden it goes, I don't know, it goes generic and it goes from like $1,000 a pill down to like 10 cents. You're like, what just happened? And that's, <laughs> that's the like, nature <laughs> of a branded product. Like once it goes generic, like right. they sometimes they'll have, what they call um, an exclusivity for like the first six months, like maybe there'll be one generic that comes on board, right? And when that generic comes on board, they can kind of keep their price maybe slightly lower than the branded mm -hmm. product before this, the exclusivity wears off and then you have a flood of generics coming into the marketplace. And then basically the branded drug is, you know, probably not even going to be prescribed anymore. Right. Yeah, that gets interesting. I know sometimes they'll like they'll like tweak it slightly. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear about this, you know, ABC drug plus two. I mean, it's just you know, it's got some slight differential. Yeah. And then it comes out again. Oh, it does this, but it also, you know, makes you look better. I don't know. I mean, you know, 
not only does it cure cancer, it makes you it makes your skin better or something. I don't know. Well, sometimes they have what they call line extensions. So right. it's It'll be a derivative of like an original drug that came out, mm -hmm. and then they'll find maybe another indication for it, for that same drug. Or they'll add something to it so that it's slightly different. But again, if the pharmacy benefit managers, when they have their, their P&T committees, if they don't see the difference, if they don't see the, the difference in the efficacy, then it's just another Me Too drug, and it really isn't going to be profitable. So how do the they determine company. whether it works? I mean, are they, are they because I, how do they know whether or not when I took the pill as a consumer, I actually saw some benefits? I know sometimes we've got prescription drugs, we take them home, and we're like, that you don't take them all, right? Sometimes you, you may need them for a period. Maybe it's for pain as an example, right? Yeah. Sometimes you may take it for a few days or not, not at all and say, I don't really need it. I'm going to leave it aside. And so, uh, but other times you well, may use the whole thing. It works. So how do they know that it's even working? So it, so it depends on the disease that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like there's certain diseases like hypertension, diabetes, where people basically take those drugs for the rest of their life. Right. Then you have another kind of class of drugs which are for, like, they're, they may be seasonal. Like if you have, um, I don't know, pink eye, you mm -hmm. don't get that all the time. Or Hopefully not. an ear infection. Right. Or an antibiotic that you might be prescribed. I mean – at least for the, the companies that I worked at, the the drugs that we really, where we made the most profit was on those drugs where there was a disease state where the patient mm -hmm. was going to be taking that drug for a long period of time. That brings up an interesting question, and right after the break, I'm going to ask you that question okay. concerning that type of drug versus the ones you take seasonally. Okay. We'll be right back. You're listening to Master Your Finance. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finance. I'm Kurt Baker here with Adrian Dove. And we've been talking about her career, her previous career in pharma, which I guess we're getting really into it. I, I'm very curious because pharma accounting to me is just fascinating. I don't know why, because when I go to pick up a drug for somebody, or a family member, I'm like, how did they even come up with these prices? I, you know, and then you go to the hospital, you come out, and then they have all these, you know, it's a thousand dollar pill, and then you know, rebate, et cetera, et cetera, and your copay is, you know, twelve dollars and thirty three cents, or some strain, and you're like. Mm -hmm. How do we get from this number all the way down to that number? Negotiated pricing and all these things. So, uh, but when we left the break, you were talking about how we have some that are kind of seasonal, right? Uh, you get the, you get pink eye as you, it was your example, and yeah. hopefully that goes away and it's not an yeah. ongoing thing. But other things you may have on an ongoing basis, and I know some people say, well, they just want to they just want to keep us chronically ill. They don't really want to cure us. Maybe they could find something that would actually cure us, and they're going to make less money. That is a viewpoint that... I mean, I hear that all the time. They're like, whoa. It's a viewpoint because there's a lot of uh, money in the R&D uh, function in pharmaceuticals. So I think there's a viewpoint that because there's so much money that's poured into research and development, instead of just making a stronger pill or a stronger drug for diabetes or hypertension, which allows you to live longer... Can we go a step further and find something that cures that? Right. But won't they put themselves out of business? Exactly. But, I mean, it's kind of an interesting predicament to be in as a company. You're like, yeah, yeah I want to I help you, but I'll, if I cure you, you'll never come back and see me again. Well, I, I just find it interesting. It is, so. That is a, that's a, a valid viewpoint, uh -huh. and it's not the first time that I've heard it. Okay. Um, but I've worked in pharmaceuticals, again, for 33 years, so I've seen a lot of the good things that, right. that and, they do. Oh, no, I, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not putting them down. I, I mean, we need them. Absolutely, we yeah. need them. I just think they're fantastic. But these are the questions that I hear, and I was just curious how you would respond as you're kind of on the inside seeing all this happen. The other thing is that I think sometimes people don't realize, like, oh, well, you know, we develop a lot of drugs in the United States. We're kind of known for that, right? And mm -hmm. then, well, if I go overseas, I can get the same thing for less money, but I think we sometimes forget that there's a lot of money that goes into R&D, and there's a lot of things that we develop that never make it. And right? we also spend so we have a to, lot of... We have to absorb that, right? We do, but the, one of the things about the, the U.S. and the way we develop drugs, there's a lot of regulatory bodies that oversee the entire process of that drug from beginning to end, from the time that it goes into the pipeline where, you know, it's, it's a new development mm -hmm. and all of the stages that you get up to where you can finally fi try to file it with the FDA. There's a lot of compliance and regulation that, that goes in along with that that you may not find in some other countries. Yeah, and I, honestly, I think that's good. I'm going to come from a totally different area. I mean, I was in the shipping industry. I was a marine mm -hmm. uh, engineer, and most of the ships are, are flagged overseas, meaning that's where they're registered. 
because their safety and requirements are significantly lower than the United States. If you go on a U.S. ship, it's going to be a, a pretty darn safe ship, and yes. you're going to have a highly trained crew. And so you rarely ever hear about a U.S. flagship getting into any serious trouble, but you hear about all these others come off because they have a lot less experience. I, I, that's just my own perspective. So I think a certain amount of oversight and, and some, some kind of a format that's proven to work and kind of keep an eye on, especially when you're dealing with people's lives, you know, their health. Mm -hmm. I think you really want to kind of make sure there's some safety measures in place. And then, so how do so how do some of the, the other countries are able, we, we basically create the drug most of the time. I mean, I guess we don't create them all, but it seems like we create a lot of them. But then they go overseas and say, well, I can buy the same drug for a lot less money. So how, can you explain how that might work? Or do you know anything about that? I mean, the overseas side of it? I really don't because, My, I mean, yeah. The last company that I worked in actually was uh, a a Swiss company, but mm -hmm. I still was my focus was on the U.S. Okay. and the process in the U.S. But yeah. um, I mean, I guess it's, their county's it's, different it's than com ours. It's competition. <laughs> right. I mean, it's competition again. But when you're dealing with your health, I would prefer me personally to have a drug that I know that's been tested. Right. It's been tested. The side effects have been tested, and that you're not going to be taking a huge risk. Right. When you put that into your body. I, I agree 100 percent, 100 percent. Well, that was fascinating. So uh, we talked a lot about your background, which uh, you did it for 33 years. I think it's amazing. I think it's an important part of our our society. I mean, we've come a long way. People kind of forget what's happened over the last 30, 40, 50 years where none of this industry really didn't exist, you know, in the last century that much. And it's, it's right. a huge part of our uh, society. And it's it led to a much higher quality of life and longevity has increased overall that period of time. So you decided, after 33 years, that this is a lot of fun, and, I, and I've done every kind of complicated accounting math that I could possibly come up with in the pharma industry. Um, so I'd like to pass along some of that expertise. I guess initially it was because, I guess it was a far, like pharma, like all businesses, they have, they have ebbs and flows, so to speak. Yes. So you got caught in one of those uh, ebbs, so to speak. I did. And... Uh, <laughs> But that happens all the time in, around here. You have a lot of highly qualified people that are like, okay, now what do I do next, right? So uh, I hear the phrase sometimes, if you can't find a job, just create one for yourself. That's kind of the U.S. thing. Is that, I, I'm going to put words in your mouth a little bit. So yes. I know that sometimes people say that, hey, oh, well, let's, why don't I do so? I use all my expertise and maybe do something. What, so what was your process? I know at first, when you get that notice, it's probably like, oh, my gosh, this kind of stinks, right? <laughs> well, it does. It's, it's like a, it's a shock to the system. Right. But when I kind of um, had a chance to to think about it and put it in perspective. It's like 33 years is a really long time. Mm -hmm. And I consider myself really fortunate because it was, um, I actually met the years of service and the age to qualify for what um, was considered early retirement. But in today's uh, environment, in a company like the one that I was restructured out of, early retirement in your 50s is not drawing on a pension. You're not old mm -hmm. enough. You can't take money out of your 401k because you're not old enough. Um, my form of retirement was subsidized health benefits, which is huge. That's a biggie. It's a huge plus. Mm -hmm. And then stock options that I had that weren't vested, they were vested for me. And so I consider myself very blessed and fortunate that I was able to take advantage of that. And I was burned out. I was tired. Mm -hmm. I was commuting an hour and a half one way, so it was three hours. Oh, my gosh. That was and, a lot. And uh, working in an environment where, you know, you, you're on call, basically, because you were given a, a, a laptop and an iPad and an iPhone, and you're always on call. <laughs> Wait, and that, that's interesting. I've never heard of accountants being on call. <laughs> well, it's, it's the environment. That's kind of fascinating. It's, it, it's really? The, it's the environment because I – so over my career, the – the basic accounting actually morphed into, like, the financial analysis. And then once I moved into the area of managed care and specialty pharmacies, and um, that became more of a hybrid role. So in addition to doing all the financial analysis, I also wrote the contracts and negotiated the contracts. So then I started getting very heavily involved with the legal staff and the um, the, what they call privacy officers and vendors. Privacy and the, officer? That's interesting. Yeah, because when you're dealing with uh, some of the pharmaceutical contracts, there's patient data okay. um, that 
you know, we're not supposed to have access to, so there's certain parameters in the contract that had to be written to make sure that uh, anything related to patient data was handled properly. And then there's adverse events. So when you're dealing with a specialty drug, so I talked about like the, just, you know, what we consider certain disease states like hypertension and diabetes. There's other more severe disease states like cystic fibrosis, and multiple sclerosis, and forms of psoriasis where you need a higher level of care. So that involved uh, specialty pharmacies. So we did contracts with specialty pharmacies where there's really high touch with patients and there's a bunch of different programs that are associated with making sure that that patient stayed on their drug because the result of a patient on multiple sclerosis not taking their medication is different than a patient that doesn't take a drug for diabetes and hypertension. The risk is higher. Okay. So, right. that, so what, I know, adverse event, I can, I can kind of imagine what it is, but what do you, I mean, from your perspective, <laughs> so, what do you consider to be an adverse so an event? an adverse event is anything that um, might happen to you physically um, as a result of taking the drug, right? And it's in the pharmaceutical contracts that we did for those specialty type disease states, it had to be very, uh, it had to be documented. Mm -hmm. So there was a whole... Uh, organization that kind of monitored when those adverse events were reported because they had to be reported within 24 hours of them happening. Okay. Like those types of things. So now you can see how I've transitioned from like this strict accounting and finance role into a hybrid. Right. Right. Because I had to know the industry. I had to understand how specialty pharmacies work and what happens to a patient when they don't take their medication. So it became very specialized and uh, the last role that I had in the company that I left was, uh, it, it was an organization called Patient Services. And Patient Services was an organization that included people like me with a very heavy finance background. There were people who were nurse educators. There were PharmDs. It, because I think what happened in the last five years, I think the pharma companies realized that it was really important to have this focus on the patient as the end result. And so, so a lot like of these that. functions that were spread around different organizations in the company, uh, they were basically brought together in one group called patient services. And so you'll find now in a lot of the different pharma companies that they have big patient service organizations. Well, that yeah. is great to hear. Um, you're listening to Master Your Finances. Uh, we'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finances. I'm Kurt Baker here with uh, Adrian Dove, and we're Talking about really her background, uh, which we've been doing for a while here, but it's such an interesting background. I apologize. But I have one more question for you, and then we're going to get into, like, what you're doing now. Okay. Um, and maybe you know about this. But say, talk about, like, the new designer drugs coming out. So how does that work into the accounting aspect where I have to – where they say they're going to, like, take your, your DNA and they're going to take your family history and then they're going to – I mean, how do they price that? Do you have any idea of how they do that? I don't. Okay. But I can imagine because it's, it's something brand new that's yeah. never been done before – it's probably going to be priced at a premium. Yeah. Okay, well, if it, if it works, if it cures me, I'm okay with that. If I take, you know, for a period well, of time. Yeah. Anyway, I just wonder if that, maybe that's, I know that's something coming that seems mm -hmm. like. I don't think we've actually done it yet. I've just, uh, but this is a constantly evolving business because you, uh, high stress, you got promoted into high stress, which happens to a lot of people. You've been <laughs> yeah. doing it for 33 years. Um, you, were, you were given the, uh, the okay to start your own business, so to speak. So you got laid off. Obviously, that was a shock. But in a way, you were kind of relieved because you had, fortunately, financially, you had a lot of benefits in place. You were financially in a pretty good spot, which is which is great because not everybody's in a place like that when they are kind of transitioned. So yeah. from that perspective, it was pretty good. But then you have to do a little bit of planning. So then what happened at that next phase once you decided, hey, I'm going to go start a business? So what kind of process did you go through to transition from being a corporate America pharma, very specialized for 33 years, and then moving into something that maybe is a little bit of the unknown, unknown area, so to speak. I think that I had to make like the conscious decision that I need to go back to my original training, which is really pure general accounting. Because again, over the years, it got very specialized, and I was doing like financial analysis and uh, the type of work that would only be done in pharma. And I had to make a decision that. Um, I'm very uh, grateful for those years and all of the things that I learned. I was like, but I want to go back to a more general accounting focused uh, uh, work. 
And I have the, I guess one of the, the things that I guess I feel very fortunate is that I have a lot of friends who are entrepreneurs. Oh, that's great. I just, I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but I have a lot of friends who work for themselves. And a couple of them approached me asking me to help them with their books. And I was like, so this, I mean, this is right in line with what I've been thinking because like my financial analysis of managed care contracts is not going to help me. Um, help them with their books. Let's so buy a... some ice aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, right. so me being the student at heart that I am, I just mm-hmm. decided that I need to go back and refresh my pure accounting skills and see what's in what's happening in the marketplace right now. And I discovered this area in the accounting marketplace of um, basically helping small businesses with their books. There's a whole community out there of QuickBooks accountants. So QuickBooks is a software. And uh, QuickBooks, Intuit, that makes QuickBooks, they have like a whole network set up of training and uh, different seminars and, and things that we can go to to meet other accountants that are actually using QuickBooks. It's like it's a whole nother world out there that I didn't know existed because my accounting world was, you know, corporate. Uh, it was using SAP, which is a system that's, you know, for really large, group, large amounts of data and large companies. So this was something new for me. And, but it was something that, I, I mean, I, I'm a good student, and I like learning new things. So it was something that I picked up very quickly. Mm-hmm. I studied it. I got certified in it, and I started helping my friends with their books. And one of my friends, you know, said, you should really form an LLC. Mm -hmm. And so I went on LegalZoom and went through all of the, you know, the different things that I needed to do to form the LLC. I had to come up with the name. You know, there's all of these different things that you have to do. But I felt like um, the fact that I, when I, when I got laid off and I decided I want to go back to my original training, accounting, and then these friends came to me and said, hey, we need help with our books. It was almost like things collided. Like that's fantastic. It was a confirmation well, that, that, that I was in the right. I was on the right track. Well, I, I could I could just tell you from like being an entrepreneurial myself is that's one of the things that you do, but you really don't want to do. It's like it's a necessary part of the business, yeah. and it's a very important part of the business. But when you're literally trying to run a business, um, it, that's that's the struggle, right? Because you have mm-hmm. to pay attention to your finances. You have you just, to. You have to. And that's where sometimes entrepreneurs go off track is they start focusing a little bit too much on the mission and, and what they're trying to do mm-hmm. and, and all the great things they're supposed to do, but they're not keeping enough of an eye on kind of the back end because the structure really does matter over a long period of time. And um, just from my own experience, what I've seen is that some entrepreneurs don't realize the importance long term if they want to sell their business. Mm-hmm. You need to back up what you're say. Oh, we, we make really good money. Um, and you're like, oh, that's great. Show me. Uh, well, maybe. You need to look on the balance <laughs> just, sheet, though. <laughs> you have to kind of trust me. They're like, because they know they're making money, yeah. um, but they're not really sure how they're making it all the time, right? Yeah. They, they might be great at sales. They might be great at producing whatever they're producing, but they're not necessarily great at understanding, well, here's my cost basis. Here's my margin. Here's my overhead. Here's mm-hmm. my variable overhead. Here's my fixed expenses and all these yeah. other pieces that have to go into this. Um, so when they want to grow... Um, so I'm just kind of curious, when you started talking to your entrepreneur friends, mm-hmm. what were the, some of the things they said, this is why I'd really need your help? What, what did you kind of notice in their world that maybe they really did need your help? Because I, I noticed a lot of creativity. You know, uh, they had uh, one um, set of friends, they harvest their own honey, both very creative people. And things that I, I guess I just took for granted because I'm an analytical person, that managing your finances is something relatively simple. And when I started working with, you know, some of my other friends who, you know, they have a, a different strength. Right. Right. There are certain things that just made perfect sense to me that didn't make perfect sense to well, them. Well, some, some of the things you <laughs> opened their eyes to that maybe like, oh, wow, I didn't yeah. really realize that. Right? Were there any things like the aha moments when you were kind of going through all these things and kind of helping them out a little bit? Because well, entrepreneurs are famous for like kind of overseeing a few, not seeing a few things, right? Sometimes it's just a matter of giving them some tips. Mm-hmm. Uh, because my niche is I'm not um, operating as a CPA. 
the right. niche that I have is right now I'm helping small businesses make sure that their book's in an order so that they can hand off at the end of the year before tax season, they can hand off all of the records that they need to hand off to their CPA. Right? I think that is a piece like this missing. Sometimes, Everybody's going to love you. Sometimes CPAs they are think love you that and the, the entrepreneur. Like the CPA is supposed <laughs> to just, you know, take like this. The shoebox. The, the right? shoebox, the right. mess. Right. And come up with like the taxes that they need to pay. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I actually am connected with some P CPAs. That's not the way they like to work. They don't oh, want no. they don't want to get a shoebox no. right before tax season. They would prefer to have someone that basically sends them a file that comes out of QuickBooks that has their P and L for every month of the year right. in order and copies of receipts, which you can kind of copy and attach in QuickBooks. Right. So that's I mean, I found that niche and I think that is is an area where People need a lot of help. Right. It's not the work that the CPA does, but it's work that's really needed. And I found that so many of the things that I did in pharma, like working with vendors and um, just negotiating contracts, I'm still using some of those skills when I'm trying to work with the business owners to help them get their records in order. Oh, are you negotiating skills? You mean with the with the their vendors or I, I, my negotiating uh, is I guess it's part of um, influencing. Okay. And helping them understand that this is something that's been neglected, but it's really important. Right. Or trying to get them to I guess to comply with some things that is going to help them in the long run. Right. right. So it's it's a matter of sitting with business owners and saying these are some best practices. I know that you are a a scientist or you're a really creative person and maybe you this is not your leaning this is not the way you operate but these little things could really help you in the long run and then trying to to kind of I guess get them to stay compliant with those things yeah. so the working with the vendors and negotiating and using those influencing skills I use them all the time <laughs> right oh that's fantastic I know <laughs> so so you, when you see, that's great because you have all the background, yeah. right? Just like you did in, in the large corporation, you understand the accounting aspect of what's going on. And so you understand maybe what the vendors should or should not be doing. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of, you, those things will stick out as far as you're concerned. You see things, well, well, that doesn't look right. Yeah. Maybe that costs too much or maybe that's not set up correctly. Correct. Yeah. Or, you know, just manage, helping them manage accounts receivable when they don't get paid the way oh, they're supposed to. Oh, that's a biggie. To. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, those are things that those negotiating skills and, and working with third parties in, in my um, pharma career actually comes in handy now. Oh, wow. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that after the break. You've been mm -hmm. listening to Master Your Finances. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finances. I am Kurt Baker here with Adrian Dove, and we've been talking about her transition from quote, big pharma accounting specialized into more of a general accounting, helping out uh, entrepreneurs and so forth. And one of the things that came up a little bit before the break was, um, and I know this is kind of an issue for some businesses where you bill. Um, so what are some of the things you've kind of helped the entrepreneurs understand a little bit better on how to maybe get those receivables to come in a little bit quicker? Because I know that's hard because if you're out there getting new business and, and that's the way you're set up as a business, I don't happen to have that issue myself, so I'm not as familiar mm -hmm. with it. But I know a lot of businesses are set up there and they get very, they get very frustrated when things go out 120, 190, yeah. you know, 60. I mean, that's a long time if you're a small business owner to wait two, three, four months to get paid. Uh, what are some tips that maybe you've passed along to them? I think making your payment terms uh, really clear, you have to really communicate that up front. Like you can uh, have your, when you invoice a customer, you have to be very clear. Is this due upon receipt? Is this due in 15 days? Is it due in 30 days? Will you, are you going to give them a discount if they pay like within 10 days? It's, it's, it has to be very clear what you communicate, and then you have to be persistent when the payment doesn't come. And I think a lot of business owners don't have time to chase after that, which is why you probably need someone um, with an accounting background or a bookkeeping background to help you stay on top of those things. And then when, if unfortunately, if you don't get paid, then you have to decide, is it going to go to collections? Eventually, you, you might have to write it off mm -hmm. as a bad debt. Right. But I think before you get to that point, you need to be very persistent and very clear on your terms. I agree. Very good. Excellent tips. 
So now that you've been in a, an entrepreneur for a little while yourself with an accounting background, so how's that transition? Because you've been doing it for a little while now. So mm -hmm. what's your thought process of um, what, what do you think? What do you think of it so far? I love being an entrepreneur, but I have to say that, you know, there was the transition. Like there's a journey that you go on because you, I went from, you know, pharmaceuticals pay very well and you're used to getting a paycheck every two weeks. Uh, you basically, you know, it's very structured. And now you're in a position where you're your own boss. You're responsible for going out and getting the clients. So even though I'm a very analytical person with a financial background, you have to kind of turn into somewhat of a salesperson mm -hmm. and being able to market yourself and learning how to network. So it's a journey that, that I'm still on, but I can see the progress. Uh, the first year was uh, difficult because you don't have the steady income that you had before. But I think uh, so many of the things that I learned 12 years ago when I started to pay really close attention to my own personal finances in terms of budgeting, I think really helped me. It helped me because I live off of a budget, a monthly budget that I do every month. And over the 12 years of doing that, uh, I became very disciplined, so I was able to, you know, save a lot of money because I saw on paper where my money was going. I saw the income and what was going out, and it resulted in, in, in me changing a lot of my behaviors and being much more disciplined. So fast forward now, 12 years later, when I'm in, in a position where I don't have the same income that I've been used to, um, I still have the discipline that I'm living off of a budget, and um, I had, you know, money saved in an emergency fund in addition to like some of the resources or the what I what I got when I left the pharmaceutical company so it's helped sustain me but I will say that I've gotten over the one year I guess hump so to speak because now I'm starting to get more clients so I think the first year like right after the planning stages you have to be patient and you have to almost submit to a process, it's a process transitioning from a corporate employee to being your own boss, to being an entrepreneur. And there's some things that I wasn't very good at networking. I'm an analytical person who's somewhat introverted. So maybe networking is not an art for me. It's more of a science, and the science can be learned. So I've learned how to network, how to meet people, um, how to sit down one-on-one -on -one with people. So maybe in my introverted personality, maybe a room full of people is not as comfortable, but if I go into a situation where there's a room full of people and I walk away with three people that I'm going to meet with one-on-one, -on -one, some of those one-on-one -on -one translates into referrals, which translates into new clients and business. And then also, uh, when I meet people one-on-one, -on -one, I'm also thinking about how I can refer business to them, which is something that I thought I wasn't going to be able to do, but I've been able to refer just in my everyday life, refer people, uh, other entrepreneurs to refer business to them as well. Yeah, you just pointed out a couple of great points that a lot of people take a long time. To, you learned that in a year. That's fantastic. One is it's not necessarily, when you're networking, it's not necessarily about what you get out of that individual. It's what you, it's, it's connecting two networks really is what yes. you're trying to do. Because there's people that you know, you a lot, 33 years you've been out there running around. I mean, you know a lot of people would be mm -hmm. surprised when you start really thinking about it and you can connect those to other people's network because they have a pretty good size. So that kind of builds that trust and that understanding and relationships. Um, and now you've made it through the year. And I think another is that I've heard from entrepreneurs. Um, you, you basically, uh, you can project out your income. It's probably going to be half that. You can project out your expenses, probably gonna be double that mm -hmm. because that's just the way the world actually seems to work. You want to budget, but you also have to be ready for that reserve requirement because yeah. it just, even when you think you're going to get clients in, uh, they're, they're maybe not um, feeling the urgency you might be feeling as, as the business owner, right? right? You're like, well, let's get started. They're like, well, you know, I've got other things to do, right? For you, for you, it's like, I'm ready. For them, it's like, well, maybe next month or maybe in, the, in, you know, in, in January. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, well, we need to do it now, right? Mm -hmm. but, but they're on a different schedule sometimes. Yeah. So you, you have to kind of understand that that's just part of the process. It and, is. And, and being persistent is really key in a nice way. In you a nice way, not in a pushy nice way, not right. in a pushy way, because right. I think the pushy way doesn't build trust. No. You want to build trust and credibility with people. And I think one of the things that I've noticed about 
being an entrepreneur is once you build that trust and credibility because you're operating with excellence and you're meeting your commitments as you're building these relationships and doing the work for the clients, they start to refer you to other people that they know. Right, because now they've seen your work. They've right? seen the work. And they're going to yeah. know other people that trust their opinion because yes. they've known them before. And they're like, hey. And that's honestly where uh, most of us, I know in my own world, that's nobody's going to work with an advisor unless they know somebody else that knows of them from a reputation standpoint. It's just, not, it's just rare. Let me just say that it rarely happens. And um, that credibility is enormous, especially when dealing with certain industries. Yes. I mean, you're not going in, you know, to buy a soda, right? So you don't really you're not worry about the retail owner. You know, as long as the can comes out, okay, you're fine. But if you're talking about something that really is close to the business integrated, there's going to be a much higher level they're going to want to get through as far mm -hmm. as trusting you before they're willing to kind of literally open their books to you and say, hey, help me out um, taking care of what I need to do. Um, so that referral is kind of key, right? So you're starting to see that develop. Yes. Um, and and I and I met you a while back, and I, and I know just from the, the short time I've known you is that you really um, and I th this comes through is that you care about the person you're talking about, talking to, and you actually really want to help them, and that really comes through. So if you genuinely try to help somebody, even if you can't do it directly, I think that really flows through. Um, so and, I think. Yeah. If my personal experience is in being an entrepreneur, you really need to be doing something that you really have a passion for because it will, it will come out in the wash if you don't. Unlike a corporate environment where you can just, you know, be just this great corporate employee and a person who learns very quickly, you could get promoted, you can do really great work and not really love the work that you do, I think... As long as you meet your objectives and your your behavior isn't outrageous, you you'll you know you'll 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 keep getting paid, you'll keep getting promoted. But I think that if as an entrepreneur, you really need to have a passion for the things that you're doing because it'll come out if you don't. People will be able to see it. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. So what's next now that you've like, you've done this? So what are your uh, that you're I mean, you're an analytical person. So what are you yeah. thinking about doing next now that you're uh, kind of got your feet wet a little bit and you seem to like what you're doing, which is fantastic. I do. So like, there's two parts of my business. There's the small business owner and the entrepreneur, where I'm actually helping them with their books, and then there's individuals and families who need help with their personal budgets because there are people out there who really have never seen on paper. Uh, in a month, you know, in a, say a, a time frame in a month, how much money they bring in and what's going out. And it could be a shock to the system when you first mm -hmm. do it. But I can tell you that over time, it'll cause people to change certain behaviors if they need to, if they need to cut expenses. It'll cause people to plan better. And so that's the other side of my business where I'm actually working with individuals and families to help them with their personal budgets. And again, that's something that they can um, use when they go to talk to their financial planner because I'm not sitting in the financial planner role. I'm sitting in a role where I'm trying to help them with the detail that goes along with them having their own budget, which is basically their own P&L. And then they can sit with their financial planner and talk about investments and other things that they, you know, they want to plan for the future. So there's that group of clients out there. And I say in both groups, the business uh, the small business owner and the entrepreneur and the family, what I'm trying to do is create a level of peace for them because a lot of times anything related to finances that where the finances are you feel like are not in order or you just don't even know what it is that you have, um, it can cause a lot of anxiety. Right. right? And so I want to be able to create a sense of peace for both of those parts of my business. So what's next is I want to be able to teach people like some form of financial literacy. Like in, when I majoring in accounting in, in college, you learned how to manage corporate finances, but not your own. Right? That's interesting. So maybe, maybe things have changed now, but mm -hmm. I think for the most part, I don't think that they're teaching personal, personal financial budgeting. I, I don't really think that's part of the curriculum. Uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe I can little, talk to a college student now and ask them if that's something that they have access to. But I, I'm seeing people now who really need to learn how to manage their own finances, just with a simple budget. 
It's a zero-based budget, so you tell your money at the beginning of the month, this is what we're going to do this month. This is how much income we have coming in. This is how many expenses we have going out, and this should net to zero. And it doesn't always happen. It doesn't always net to zero, and that's where we have to go in and start changing behavior and relooking at, you know, if either we're spending too much money, we need to cut down, or maybe we need to try to do some things that bring in more income. Well, that's fantastic. I have to agree with you 100%. We need a lot more financial literacy uh, in the country because when people better understand what's happening, it actually, I agree with you, it actually lowers stress level and they actually understand what's happening in the numbers. It's actually not as scary as people sometimes think, but when they actually do it, because we do a lot of that when they're transitioning into retirement or maybe changing jobs, we make sure that all of it works out. And uh, I can tell you that when, anytime I've ever seen anybody do that process, their stress level just drops like two or three notches. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, now I understand mm -hmm. what's happening, and they have a much better um, sense of control, uh, I, I think is really it. Uh, well, thank you very much, Adrian, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, I enjoyed having you. You've been listening to Master Your Finances. I am Kurt Baker, Certified Financial Planner Professional. I can be reached uh, at 609-716-4700. You can listen to this podcast and all our podcasts uh, by subscribing at MasterYourFinances.us. Remember that together we can master your finances so you can enjoy financial peace of mind.